body doubles, CGI, and prosthetics. Studios have had to switch out actors for decades, and in many cases, audiences didn't notice. But which big switch resulted in a lawsuit? Furious 7 was maybe halfway through filming when series star Paul Walker tragically died in an automobile accident. The production shut down temporarily so that producers could consult with Walker's family on what they'd like to do. As the star of the film, there was no way to move forward without him, and there simply wasn't enough footage filmed already to try to cobble a movie together. Walker's family agreed that the movie should be finished and his two brothers volunteered as stand-ins since both closely resembled the actor physically. With the help of the special effects crew, visual effects turned Cody and Caleb Walker into Paul Walker for the remainder of the film. The swap was well known among fans, with the ending sequence including a tribute to Walker. Furious 7 went on to be the biggest hit of the franchise and one of the biggest films of all time, grossing over $1.5 billion. British actor Oliver Reed was just as famous for his hard partying ways as he was for appearances in films, and when he died in 1999 after a night of heavy drinking, friends agreed that he probably went the way he would have wished. They're most likely right. In a 1994 interview, Reed gave his own obituary which began, I died in a bar of a heart attack full of laughter. However, while Reed's passing might have been ideal for the actor, it caused a major headache for the cast and crew of Gladiator, which he was filming before his demise. As Gladiator visual effects supervisor Rob Harvey told the BBC, Reed's death forced the Gladiator team to rewrite the film's ending, and it still required quite a bit of visual trickery to pull together. Some of Reed's performance was cobbled together from outtakes. The rest of the time, especially during wide shots, a body double with Reed's face digitally attached filled the void. Harvey told the BBC, it's a very weird thing to have to do, particularly then, when the technology wasn't really there at all. Still, it worked well enough. Reed was nominated for a BAFTA for his Gladiator performance in 2001, nearly two years after he passed away. I know that you would die for honor. This may be the ultimate actor switcheroo. So egregious was this swap that it resulted in not just a lawsuit against the producers, but new regulations from the Screen Actors Guild to prevent it from ever happening again. So what happened? Crispin Glover refused to reprise his role as George McFly in the sequels to Back to the Future due to a dispute over his salary or ethical concerns about the moral of the movie, depending on which story you believe. Yes, I'm George. George McFly. Unable to come to an agreement with Glover, producers recast the role with Jeffrey Weissman. So far, so good, right? Then they covered Weissman in makeup and prosthetics that had been cast from Glover's face in the first movie when they aged him for the scenes when he's older. Weissman became a Crispin Glover doppelganger, basically trading on the actor's appearance without actually using him. After Glover's lawsuit, which he won, the Screen Actors Guild made it a rule that no actor's likeness could be stolen in such a way again. Veteran actor John Rhys Davies actually had two roles in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In addition to portraying the dwarf Gimli, who becomes a member of the Fellowship, he also lent his voice to Treebeard the Ent. This put him in the unique position of being a physical actor on screen as well as a voice actor for a character created with special effects. And you have my bow. And my axe. Yet the actor didn't spend quite as much time on screen as Gimli as it appears. There were actually a couple of reasons behind this. Rhys Davies is over six feet tall and his height posed problems, considering the actor was supposed to be playing a diminutive figure who is not much taller than the hobbits. This wasn't a deal breaker though, as the filmmakers already had to employ a series of camera tricks and visual effects to get everyone on screen looking the right size. Instead, the main reason Rhys Davies was swapped out so much during filming was down to a severe allergic reaction he had to the prosthetic makeup used as part of his costume. Unless the scene involved a close-up of Gimli's face or the character speaking, the chances are that it was actually stunt double Brett Beatty. In total, Beatty spent more than 2,000 hours as Gimli and became such an integral part of the cast that he was offered the opportunity to get a matching tattoo with the rest of the Fellowship actors. Although it was far from her first role, Fifty Shades of Grey did bring Dakota Johnson to the public's attention and helped make her a worldwide star. Based on the erotic fiction novels by E. L. James, the series sees Johnson as the young and relatively naive Anastasia Steele, who embarks on a journey of sexual awakening with Christian Grey. Just like the novels, the movies feature graphic encounters that include everything from bondage to sadomasochism. So it might not come as a surprise that the young actor had a double who stood in for her, as many actors request for sex scenes. But it wasn't a case of shyness or an unwillingness to appear nude that spurred the decision. Instead, Johnson had a large tattoo on her backside that would have been difficult to hide. Feeling that the tattoo wasn't in keeping with Anastasia's character, the filmmakers replaced Johnson in nude scenes with someone who looked close enough like her in terms of body shape and size that the switch wouldn't be noticeable. 
While Arnold Schwarzenegger is undoubtedly the face of the Terminator franchise, the main protagonist and only other figure who is present throughout most of the series is Sarah Connor. A number of women have taken on the role of the battle-hardened fighter over the years, but Linda Hamilton is most closely associated with the character, having appeared in a total of three films. The second of these outings came in Terminator 2 Judgment Day, with Sarah battling against an upgraded T-1000 Terminator with the help of her son and a reprogrammed T-800. Near the end of the movie, there is a moment when the T-1000, which can morph into any shape or form, takes on the appearance of Sarah in one last attempt to lure out John Connor so it can kill him. Get out of the way, John! 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 Shoot! Director James Cameron didn't use CGI to achieve the effect, with one of the Sarahs instead played by a different actor. The person in question was not a professional actor, but a nurse named Leslie Hamilton Guerin, who just so happened to be Linda Hamilton's twin sister. The pair looked so alike that viewers would never know the original actor wasn't playing both parts. Despite a rocky history of cancellations and controversy, Family Guy has become one of television's most popular and successful animated sitcoms. Since its debut in 1999, the show has broadcast over 400 episodes and largely retained the same voice cast for its core group of characters. Seth MacFarlane provides the voices of Peter, Stewie, and Brian, for example, while Seth Green and Alex Borstein have played Chris and Lois since the very beginning of the series. The one outlier to this is Meg. Meg actually had a different voice actor throughout the first 14 episodes of Family Guy. Lacey Chabert originally voiced the role until she was forced to leave due to other commitments. Dad, what are you doing? Get out of here! Mila Kunis was subsequently hired to replace her, but viewers continued to see several alternating episodes where the voice actors swapped back and forth as the broadcast order differed from the recording order. The difference is obvious to listeners, and so many knew of the switch between actors. What am I gonna do? Michael's out there waiting for me! This example is a little different from the rest, as it is impossible not to notice that Heath Ledger's character in The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus was also played by several other actors, Johnny Depp, Colin Farrell, and Jude Law. What you may not have realized, however, is that this was never intended to be the case, and that Ledger would have originally portrayed Tony Shepard throughout the entire film if it wasn't for his tragic death. The actor died just a month into production, long before his scenes were completed. This left the movie in a state of limbo for several months. During that time, director Terry Gilliam developed the idea of Shepard magically transforming into different versions of the character as he travels through dream worlds. This allowed the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus to be completed, and for the change in actor to be plausibly explained within the fictional narrative. The fantasy elements of the film also meant that the switch would not be too distracting for audiences, as the dreamlike sequences allowed for the distortion of reality. Still, to anyone paying attention, it was obvious that the other three actors stood in as replacements for Ledger, though they were not part of the original story. Jean Harlow is another example of an actor who died before she could complete the filming of her last project. In this case, it was the romantic comedy Saratoga. The film sees Harlow appear opposite Clark Gable as the granddaughter of a farm owner who has recently become engaged to a wealthy businessman. I'm going to be married. Unfortunately, Harlow's health suffered even before production started, with reports suggesting that she had sun poisoning and numerous infections. A heavy drinker in her later life, Harlow may not have been able to tell that some of her symptoms were indicative of a serious condition. The actor had constant headaches, suffered from bouts of vomiting, and had a swollen face. She was eventually diagnosed with renal failure, following damage to her kidneys from scarlet fever when she was a child, and died on June 7, 1937. By this point, Saratoga was largely completed, although Harlow had not filmed all of her scenes. The studio initially wanted to recast the part and reshoot all of her scenes, but fan outcry forced a change. Instead, Mary Dees performed the physical part of Harlow on screen, with the director disguising her appearance by using shots and angles that obscured her face, while voice actress Paula Winslow imitated the actor's voice to provide the character's dialogue. Jill Hennessy is an experienced actor, yet she is probably best known for portraying prosecutor Claire Kincaid on Law & Order, a role she held for three seasons. Over the course of 69 episodes, Jill was an integral part of the show, but she was forced to let someone else play Kincaid for a single episode in season six. Although she did film some parts for the episode, she was unavailable for other scenes as she was busy filming a special crossover episode of Homicide Life on the Street that featured several characters from Law & Order. Rather than delay filming, the director took advantage of the fact that Jill has an identical twin sister. Jacqueline Hennessy is a television host and magazine editor who shares a striking resemblance to Jill. Jacqueline had no lines, but appears in several scenes of the episode Corpus Delicti, usually sitting at the prosecutor's table in the courtroom as other lawyers argue the case. This allowed filming to go ahead without the need to totally omit Kincaid, and fans would have never known that a switch had taken place if it hadn't been revealed. Matt Damon has been involved in some pretty great movies during his career, and he has never been afraid to do whatever it takes to get the necessary performance for the role. 
One of the recent highlights was The Martian, a 2015 adaptation of Andy Weir's novel. Damon plays Dr. Mark Watney, an astronaut who is left behind and has to survive alone on Mars as NASA races to rescue him. Surprise! I did not die on Sol 18. Part of his struggle involves getting enough food to stay healthy, something that leads to the astronaut losing a lot of weight. While it isn't uncommon for actors to lose or gain weight for certain roles, Damon didn't end up having to starve himself for his role in The Martian. While that may have initially been the plan, a heavy shooting schedule and other commitments made it impossible for Damon to lose a significant amount of weight for the movie. According to Damon, the way The Martian was shot meant it was much easier and cheaper to use body doubles. The double was only used for two shots, and his face is hidden or obscured in them, so it's almost impossible to know that it isn't actually Damon walking around as Dr. Mark Watney when watching the film. Tom Hanks is undeniably one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. He has remained in demand over the course of more than four decades with a wide array of hits. Anyone who has seen Forrest Gump will know that Forrest does a lot of running during the movie, an impressive feat given that as a child the character wears leg braces and struggles to walk. Run, Forrest, run! Obviously, Tom wasn't expected to do all that running himself, and a stand-in was often needed so the actor could film more important scenes elsewhere. The problem was that Tom has a very particular gait when running, and the filmmakers struggled to find anyone who could replicate it. That is, until they came across Tom's brother, Jim Hanks. Thanks to the fact that they share the same DNA, Jim was able to run just like Tom and made the perfect body double, meaning that any time Forrest is running on screen, there's a good chance it is actually not the Hanks you thought it was. By the time Titanic came out, Leonardo DiCaprio was very much a heartthrob for millions of people around the world and a genuine film star, largely due to his breakout role in Romeo and Juliet. The success of James Cameron's disaster epic, which became the highest grossing movie of all time when it was released, made him an even bigger name. Appearing opposite Kate Winslet, the pair portray two lovers who begin a whirlwind romance while on the doomed ship. At one memorable moment during the film, DiCaprio's Jack Dawson sketches a picture of a nude Rose while she relaxes in her stateroom. The scene depicts DiCaprio carefully drawing Winslet, although any close-ups of his hand putting pencil to paper are not his. Winslet revealed that it was actually James Cameron's hands during those shots, and that the sketch was in fact created by the director, who was a skilled artist. The footage was simply flipped in post-production so that it appeared as if Cameron's left hand was actually DiCaprio's right hand. Wesley Snipes found a lot of success as the vampire hunter Blade during the late 1990s and early 2000s. Don't know I try fire for change. As one of the first adult-focused superhero films, it set the stage for the darker and more mature adaptations that were to follow. After the first film proved to be a hit, two sequels were produced, and David S. Goyer, who was responsible for penning the script of all three movies, eventually ended up taking on directing duties for the third and final outing. That may well have proved a mistake for Goyer. Blade Trinity ended up being a huge mess, as production troubles constantly affected the project. Snipes, now with an executive producer role, seemingly objected both to the script and the choice of Goyer as director. His co-star, Patton Oswalt, later spoke out about Snipes' behavior on set, claiming that his dispute with Goyer became so bitter that he refused to shoot scenes, spending all of his time in his trailer, and only communicating by passing notes. Goyer told Uproxx that making Blade Trinity was the most difficult and painful thing he had experienced, with the director ultimately forced to get creative in order to finish filming. For anything but close-ups, Snipes' body double was used, meaning that whole chunks of the film don't actually feature the actor as Blade at all. It isn't unusual for actors to tap out for sex scenes and instead have a stand-in play the part of the character. They might have objections to appearing nude, or simply be uncomfortable with that type of scene. In the case of Fight Club, the sheer amount of time needed to film the sex scene may have caused the switch to body doubles so that the actors could work on other scenes simultaneously. Speaking to Vulture, body double Laura Grady explained that she and Brad Pitt's body double filmed the sex scene with director David Fincher over the course of two weeks. She told the publication, So we spent two weeks with David Fincher on a set and green screen, just reenacting all of those sex scenes. I did see Brad Pitt and Helena Bonham Carter throughout the day, but they were never in my scenes. The end result is so convincing that it is unlikely to raise any suspicions that it was not the two lead actors in the scene. Robert Downey Jr. was the face of the Marvel Cinematic Universe for more than a decade, with the actor donning the metal armor of Iron Man and helping to save the Earth from a vast array of threats. Of course, the MCU films are full of visual effects, so the fact that Iron Man is generally encased in an outer shell that covers his entire body meant that the character was probably quite frequently created only using CGI. After all, having Downey Jr. flying around fighting aliens would be pretty hard to ensure. In three, two, one. When you can be sure that the actor is actually on screen is when we see Tony Stark out of uniform. 
Without the armor, Stark is just a talented human who would be impossible to capture on film without Downey to play the part. At least, that's what you might think. The truth is that the filmmakers created a fake version of the actor during production for Iron Man 3 after he injured his ankle and was unable to walk for several weeks. Rather than put a complete halt to filming, Weta Digital was able to use a body double to replicate Downey's performance and then merge the actor's face with the body double to make a convincing fake Tony Stark. Using this effect, the entire beach scene at the end of Iron Man 3 was able to be shot without Downey even being present on set. 2017's Justice League was Warner Brothers' first real chance to rival the MCU and show that it was capable of putting together an ensemble movie with the same impact as the Avengers. Unfortunately for DC fans, the end result failed to match expectations, and Justice League was something of a confusing mess. There are a lot of behind-the-scenes reasons for that, but chief among them was the fact that Joss Whedon was brought in to replace Zack Snyder as director. Reshooting much of the film, Whedon inserted a number of completely new scenes. One of these involved the Flash falling on Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman. It seems Whedon wanted this to be a funny comedy moment to inject some lightheartedness into the movie, but Gadot felt differently and the scene does have something of a creepy edge to it. While there's never been confirmation from Gadot or Whedon, online rumors claim that the actor refused to shoot the scene, forcing the director to use a body double. This is the reason why Gadot's face is rarely shown during this moment, as a stunt double is performing the part instead of her. Hugo Weaving has always had a knack for playing villainous roles and got his chance to play another antagonist in 2011 when he was cast as Red Skull in Captain America The First Avenger. A secretive Hydra agent who works for the Nazis, Red Skull acquires his monstrous appearance after he consumes Abraham Erskine's Super Soldier Serum. He resented my genius and tried to deny me what was rightfully mine. Following his appearance in that film, Red Skull was largely absent from the MCU until his sudden re-emergence in Avengers Infinity War. This time around, though, the character was no longer played by Weaving. Instead, Ross Marquand took on the role, although fans may not have even realized this given the extensive prosthetics and makeup used for the character. We are all wrong. Weaving has provided a few reasons why he didn't return for Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. He told Collider that the first film was good to do, but it didn't really excite him. He later explained that he was offered less money to reprise the role, despite promises that he would receive a higher fee if he were ever to return to the franchise. In 2004's Hellboy, Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense Scientist Abe Sapien was played by two individuals. Doug Jones took on the responsibility of physically portraying the character on screen, while David Hyde Pierce provided the voice. Don't worry about fingerprints. Never had any. This wasn't necessarily what director Guillermo del Toro had in mind when he set out to make the film, but he was essentially forced to use Pierce by the studio that financed the movie as a way of getting some bigger names involved. The studio's plan didn't exactly work. Pierce felt Jones had already performed the voice for the character perfectly and chose to imitate his performance as closely as possible. The veteran actor even refused to receive any credit for the role, and when it came time for the sequel to enter production, he declined to return. This led to Jones taking on the part completely instead of just being the on-screen actor, although the similarity in both vocal performances makes it difficult to tell that any change actually took place. He just wants the world outside to know what we do. Mm -hmm. Without Pierce graciously stepping back, Jones might not have been given the chance to fully realize Abe for Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, and several other Hellboy projects without studio politics getting in the way. 